In a world where busyness is worn like a badge of honor, it's almost impossible to imagine breaking free from the shackles of success. Working long hours, skipping meals, missing or being late to important life events, constantly playing catch up, exhausted to the bones. This has been normalized, especially in the medical and healthcare arena. Practice owners are fleeing to corporate practices or leaving medicine altogether in hopes of recapturing their time and energy. But you are here for a reason and you've been searching for answers. Welcome to Thriving Practice. I'm your host, Tracy Cherpesky. I'm an executive coach and consultant and time leadership expert. I'm mom to two amazing teenagers and a menagerie of adopted furry family members. I am on a mission to help practice owners take back at least one day per week for the rest of their careers so they can focus on healing their patients and falling back in love with their practice. Together we learn, connect with like-minded practice owners and medical business experts, and expand your connection to an international community of peers. In each episode, we discuss the business of medicine and healthcare, how to avoid the pitfalls of success, and how to improve the bottom line, paving the way to exquisite fulfillment in your career and life. Join us each week to learn how you can grow your practice while focusing on what you love most. You'll want to take notes. So let's go. Hi, everyone. Thanks for tuning in today for a new episode of Thriving Practice, the business podcast for medical and healthcare practices where we help practice owners grow their business and take back their time. Today's episode is part one of two, and I am speaking with the very intentional Dr. Yishai Barkadari, clinical psychologist, podcast host, and entrepreneur extraordinaire. In this first part of our interview, Yishai shares how he grew his practice and how he focuses on the in part of his therapy business. What I mean by in is clinical time where he's working directly with his patients. Of course, as a therapist, he spends a lot of time listening to his patients, but as you'll hear, a therapist does more, much more than simply listen. Yishai took us through some of his thought process with respect to how he's listening to his patients to serve them at a high level, improve the therapy process for them, and after he's finished with clinical hours, how he thinks over his day, the patterns he's recognized, and the language his patients used so he can better serve potential clients through his marketing copy. Now, you may notice we interchange the words patient and client. This is really common in therapy practices. You'll note that when Yishai started his therapy business, he used multiple avenues to attract clients and has ultimately streamlined which services he used as he really learned which ones bring him his most ideal client. So you're not going to want to miss when he shares how he shows his patients what he does, how he shares his expertise, and and if he's not a fit, he actually helps people find a different therapist. I think this is really cool. So stay tuned for part two coming next week, where Yisha and I shift from talking about working in the business, which in his case, again, is clinical hours with existing clients and interviewing potential new clients. In part two next week, we're going to go much more in depth about how he focuses on providing value, separating clinical time from strategic time. This is the working on the business part. So, and that's really, really important. And between you and me can be one of the most challenging things for my clients who are provider owners. So I invite you to listen today and take note of the intentional way in which Yishai approaches his therapy business. And stay tuned for next week when we deep dive into high-level strategic thinking. You know what to do now. Grab a beverage or a snack and settle in to listen to Yishai and his amazing journey. Yishai, it is so good to have you on the show. Thank you so much for coming today. It's my pleasure. I'm really pumped to be here. Me too. I know as we were warming up, I'm like, whoa, we got to remember to talk about that. We should have been recording. (laughs) So thrilled to have you here. And before we dive in, I'd love to tell our listeners where you are at in the world. I am in my home office in New Jersey. Awesome. And you are, so you are a therapist and you recently started a private practice. So I would love to just go straight into that. Tell us about what you do, who you serve and how starting up your practice has gone so far. Yeah. Well, there's a, there's a lot to say here. So I'm a licensed psychologist, a uh, practice owner, and I provide virtual therapy to patients in 32 states. So, and that number is actually ticking up as we go, uh, which is excellent. I'm really excited about that. 
I help high-performing, intellectual, results-oriented professionals navigate issues related to emotion, like anxiety, stress, anger, grief, that kind of stuff, self-confidence, everything from self-esteem, imposter syndrome, guilt, shame, to something I like to call entrepreneur never satisfied syndrome, actually came from a guest who was on my podcast, and relationships as well, including things like dating, couples, marriage, parenting, family, friends, all kinds of stuff related to that. My clientele includes both individual uh, therapy patients and couples who are professionals, entrepreneurs, and business or practice owners who are generally doing really well and they're financially comfortable, but they experience some part of their lives as getting in the way of being their best selves and living their richest life. And my bespoke approach to therapy really tailors sessions to you know my clients' goals and needs uh, with expertise in both psychotherapy and really high-level coaching. I really blend them as needed, uh, and that promotes progress towards clear, measurable goals, as well as, you know, emotion-based therapeutic work. Um, and then I also speak about adaptability in the human brain. I host a podcast on business psychology and performance. It's called The Business Couch with Dr. Yishai. Tagline is where psychology and business sit down to chat. And it's my mission to enrich as many lives as possible. So a little bit about my practice and its development. So I gave notice i like decided in july of 2021 that it was actually june-ish that i started looking for other jobs um, from the practice i was at it was time for me to move forward and i really have a great appreciation for the practice that i was at which i was at for about four years uh beforehand and so it was time for me to move on i did a bunch of interviews and on like two-thirds of them um, i got Pretty much every interview gave me a job offer, like on the spot. And two thirds of them were like with practice owners, and they were like, Why aren't you starting your own practice? Mm. And I like, you know, gave reasons. And then that put a little worm in my brain. I was like, You know, maybe. Um, and the reasons that I had at the time was really about I didn't want to have to hold all of the business pieces up. Now, I speak to business people and entrepreneur, I coach and consult as well. And so I'm very aware of those things. And that's something that I've learned a lot about. At the same time, I was in a point of a lot of transition, just had a daughter. We were in the process of moving, uh, planning to move. And I was really thinking like, this is not something I want or I'm able to take on right now. And then come August, I was just looking at it, crunching some numbers. Um, and you'll hear this from me a bunch. Um, I was kind of doing my gear check, as it were, like really figuring out what does this all look like if I go for a job and what's the pay or the cap for pay that I can that I can have and then having to pay taxes and stuff. And what does that look like if I start uh, my own practice? And if I'm going to do that, how do I do that in a way that minimizes the stuff that I was very honestly telling, you know, the directors and founders of these, you know, large, um, really well-known and, you know, high charging, high paying practices you know, why I didn't want to start my own practice. How do I actually handle all of that or get it handled so I don't have to deal with it as much as possible? And so I made the decision in August. I turned all of the offers down. And then I immediately started in the process of getting the company, the LLC formed um, in New York, which is where I'm based. Um, it's a PLLC, which is professional LLC. Anyone who's in a profession like lawyers, doctors, uh, accountants, they can't do a regular corporation. They have to do a professional one. So it goes also through our education. So I had to go like through the education department into the state department. There's all kinds of complicated stuff there. Um, but that really kind of came through in November. I gave notice. I'd given notice to my previous boss, the owner of the practice, probably around July. And we were kind of talking about navigating and, and figuring out what is the good time for the practice and for me to transition out. So I... I stopped seeing clients at that practice end of year. I started seeing clients in my own practice beginning of the new year, beginning of 2022. And then I supervised uh, for another month after that to really kind of help and facilitate the transition for, I was supervising a handful, um, three, four, five clinicians who were also um, you know, doing therapy and providing services. So I was transitioning out of that and kind of giving them that support so that they can have another supervisor, someone who can really, you know, help them learn and grow and develop into their uh, their best clinicians um, and provide the best services. So I launched in January. January, all of January was crickets. Half of February was crickets. And then second half of February, 
I started growing 30% week over week and I just overstopped. Like I was, I was filled by <laughs> beginning, middle of March, uh, by the end of March. So at the beginning, uh, my revenue was zero. I had taken out a loan from like a family, um, meaning me, my wife, uh, and we'll, we'll include my daughter and my family. Um, so we took that money, invested in the business and I didn't pay myself the entire Q1. And then by the end of Q1, we paid back the loans and I was already generating 12K a month, um, pretty much consistently, just how, given how the growth exploded. And not only that, but the admin stuff was basically 90% off my plate already. So I was really much more focused on providing services, which I love to do. I love, love, love doing therapy, being a therapist. Um, being a psychologist, I'm never going to stop. doesn't matter what else I do. Um, I'm going to do that until the day I can no longer do that. Uh, whether that means I drop dead or for some reason, I just like not, my brain's not there anymore. Um, though apparently people who do that, their, our brains tend to keep pretty sharp because gotta be, uh, so it's another way of keeping myself also having quality of life long-term, I think, I hope. Um, but yeah, so my practice exploded and, and the crazy thing was like, we were then looking to move. And so in order to do some of that paperwork, we had to like, you know, show proof of income and stuff. And I just showed like a bank statement <laughs> from the previous two months. This was in April of this year of 2022. I just showed like a bank statement of the revenue from the last two months. And they were like, okay, <laughs> <laughs> um, we don't need anything else. Like, uh, so well, they also showed them my credit score, which, you know, is great. Thank thankfully. But like I basically doubled my income from what I was making previously. Not really doubled, maybe one and a half, you know, starting EBITDA and whatnot, um, and like post-tax stuff. So like definitely quality of life changes. There's certainly a lot of stuff happening. Um, I also, the, the other thing about it is I work nine to five Monday to Thursday and nine to one Fridays. So I designed my practice to create, to be built around my life instead of building my life around my practice. I know, Tracy, that's something you say. And that- Nodding my head. <laughs> yep. Um, and so I really took that to heart. I mean, that was one of the reasons that I didn't want to start a practice to begin with, which was, I think, a mistaken or incorrect belief. Or rather, it was a belief, not incorrect. That's a shortcut. It was a belief that held me back and it was based on a bunch of assumptions. And the assumptions didn't need to bear out that way. And the thing is, I have a lot of colleagues who who have started or tried to start their own practices, and they have overloaded themselves with all this stuff that I initially really, really meticulously avoided um, and also outsourced. Um, and that made all the difference. So it doesn't mean I don't work after nine. My clinical work ends at nine. I still do paperwork. I'm still taking care of other stuff. And there's you know a whole lot more to business, which I've definitely learned than just the clinical work. Um, I do keep my practice small. So I'm I'm now mostly full. I often have like one slot that opens up and then very quickly it's taken. And then, you know, uh, as I'm kind of working with patients, one another one will open up. Um, but yeah, so like I often now, if I have any availability, it's like one or two and I even had like a waiting list. Um, and so that's been really interesting. And I started taking insurance and had fortunately negotiated really great rates, rates that were above what some of my colleagues were doing just in private practice, like full cash pay. And so I only took one insurance because they were the one insurance that actually, you know, would work with me that way. And that really gave me a lot of freedom. Um, I also learned that there are different like acquisition channels. It's a whole different ball game when you're looking at private pay than when you're trying to get through insurance. And I know you asked me to talk about my journey a little bit. One of the things that happened was I started with three, four, five, and then I grew to seven or six, uh, eight or nine different like channels to try to get clients coming in. So it's like psychology today profiles. I mean, there's so many different ones of them. Another one was Alma, Edway, uh, Choosing Therapy. Um, gosh, it's such a long list of them. Can't even remember all of them right now. Um, there are a bunch more of them. And what happened was a lot of them made, like in their marketing, they said, we'll help you acquire clients. And so going back, re reversing a little bit, in January, I had like three, four of them. And then by the end of January, I was panicking, which like, sure, I launched a practice. I was like, hey world, I'm here. And I am, Where are you? you know, 
and I am all set up and I'm good to go, right? And I even gave myself lead time between November and, and January to really set up all of the kind of systems. I, I called it a gear check, right? To make sure that everything was kind of lined up so that I could hit the ground running. Like if uh, someone reached out to me, it'd be like, okay, here's a system, like have an onboarding process, even have a process from a lead to a consultation call to, you know, I think my closing, you call it closing rate, but like my rate of patients who I have consultations with who come in for an appointment is like 80, 90, 95%, something like that. Um, and I did learn a few lessons the hard way, um, but I, I tried to set myself up. And then what I discovered was many of the companies that said, we'll help you acquire clients weren't particularly doing it for me. And mm. what's interesting, and you and I actually had some conversations about this. Um, what's interesting is I discovered there were two things happening. One was on their end, some of it was on their end, and some of it was on my end. On my end, I didn't have the same clarity that I have today about who my ideal clients are. In fact, when I was you know, in grad school and when I was getting my license and when I was in the practice that I was in before, it was very generalist. It was like anybody who comes across you know, your lap, just take them uh, unless, and in my case with a private practice, it was like, unless they are at risk, in which case they need a higher level of care. At risk means like self-harm, suicidal intent, um, you know, or attempts, um, those kinds of things, those we would refer out, but basically anything and everything else that came in, you, the, there was this kind of like pressure or expectation that like, if you're a decent therapist, you're supposed to be supposed to be able to work with all of that. And I think there's some value and truth to that. It's helpful to be able to be flexible based on client needs. Uh, something that I've learned very much the hard way and has taken me from January to today, really a process of <laughs> eight plus months is that getting clarity on who I serve best is a massive part of being able, of them being able to find me. Because mm -hmm. if my profile doesn't speak to them, doesn't call them out, doesn't empathize with them, doesn't show them that I get them, and doesn't also draw them in, not because I'm trying to manipulate them, but show them that, look, this is what I do. And I do this all day, every day. And if you want someone who's an expert at this, like, I got you covered if you want it. And if not, I'm happy to help you find it. it doesn't have to be me. And that's like my philosophy. Without that, even if they were really good at helping me acquire clients, the clients I was getting, and I actually had this issue earlier on, I would have clients who came in, they'd come in for one or two appointments and they'd be like, they would just drop out. And what's interesting is first or second appointment, I would already kind of notice or feel it. It would be like, okay, I get it. We're not super jiving. Or, or you say you want this, the way you're showing up is a little bit different than what I am I thought I was hearing. Or, you know, and, and we don't always know exactly what we want. It's kind of like you go to a restaurant, you order something, and sometimes like halfway through eating it or after a couple of bites, you're like, I kind of wish I got the other thing, which is mm -hmm. fine, right? At a restaurant, if you really wanted to and you're willing to put down the resources, you can say, okay, I'm going to stop eating this. Maybe I'll pack it for later, maybe not. And let me just order the other thing, right? Um, a lot of people won't do that. Um, they're just going to stick to the thing uh, in that moment. The thing with therapy is that you really need that in order for the therapy to be helpful and for me to do my best work and for the client to get what they want out of it. So, you know, it was always in my interest and in their interest. And I'm super aligned with their interest. I care probably more about their outcomes than they do. And that's probably saying a lot because how much more could a person care about what they get than when they feel like they need to go to therapy? Um, and so like that, again, it's, it's really part of every piece of my process is the most important thing to me is that you're going to be getting what you need as a client. Reminds me, I need to make a disclaimer. I'm a psychologist, but I'm not your psychologist. You as like listener and, you know, of course you Tracy as well. Um, and so take any or all of this, anything that's, you know, kind of from a psychologist, take it, you know, do your own research and don't take it as, you know, a therapist uh, said such, such and such, and you're supposed to do such and such because so-and-so therapist said it. So, you know, do your own research. I'm not your psychologist, you're a therapist. Um, I do need to make that disclaimer. Yeah. Well, yes, that's important. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just thinking about like the process of fine tuning and clarifying for your own self, but also in the way you write your profile um, copy. So mm -hmm. uh, for for the different um, avenues for for bringing clients in, I think it's a really that's a really good point to make because I've had clients over the years who 
maybe started out as sort of generalists in their practice, but consistently worked with a particular type of person. One client I'm thinking of was like started out as in just kind of a generalized naturopath, but saw a lot of women for fertility issues mm-hmm. and for reproductive issues. And over time became well known for that. Mm-hmm. And then kind of hit a tipping point really where he was still seeing, you know, some patients for, I don't know, like PT type stuff, you know, body injuries, things like that. And we worked through that. It's like, well, what, what's in it for you and what's in it for your patients if you decide to specialize and get really, you know, really clear on what you do and who you serve and how you can support them. And, you know, I'm happy to report now, like he, his joke is he's helped, you know, tens of thousands of women get pregnant. <laughs> so, but it's worked really well, but it was, of course, it's this kind of scary moment of like, I am not choosing to be a generalist, which means that I might get fewer inquiries. Maybe. Who knows? Well, that's but an assumption, right? It is an assumption. And yeah. then, and then we decide to do it. And it's, I think it's a bit of a leap of faith. So what, as you've, as you've kind of tightened up the language in your profiles and gotten more clear yourself, what have you seen change? Has there been a shift in inquiries and who you work with? So I've seen a couple of things change. One is I actually got a better idea of these different kind of platforms and marketing platforms that I was using. I got a better idea of who they're for. Some of them were not for me. And so I ended up dropping them uh, because their price point was not consistent with my price point. Um, And that also speaks to something else, which is they were serving a different group of people and they were trying to attract a different group of people than my practice is interested in. So what I've discovered as I've really fine-tuned this and thing is every time I think I got it nailed, there is another piece to it. It's like a puzzle and you like you you put two, three pieces together and you're like, oh I got this. And then you put three, four, five more pieces onto it and you're like, oh it's a thing. And then you you put another 20 pieces around it and it's like Oh goodness gracious, this is like, you know, we're we're flying now. And and so the thing is, like, I don't really know how big the puzzle is. Um, and it's funny because we're talking about niching or getting even more clear and narrow. And at the same time, it actually makes the puzzle bigger. Um, mm-hmm. and I've discovered this where it used to be that if I shared with somebody like what my my price was for therapy, they would say, Oh, I'm not sure. Or I would talk to them about what I do. And they're like, okay, maybe. And again, in my consultation calls, most of the time, like I could adapt to what they were looking for and tell them or show them how I could address those things. It's not the ideal or the specific, it's not what the specificity of who I work with best, what they are struggling with, their kind of very particular pain point or pain points and how I help them with that process or, or what role I, I play in that process. So one thing that I started finding is as I've gotten clearer and clearer and clearer, I've been able to communicate that both in the language I use in the profiles. And then there are more people who reach out to me that are like, I like this that you said, I like that that you said, or this really resonated, or this is what's going on for me. And I wanted you for this reason. So now people are reaching out to me and they're they're telling me why they want me. Mm-hmm. Which, if we take a step back and uh, and think about like marketing and sales and stuff like that, right? There's a lot of this thought process that you need to go explain to people why they should engage you, right? Mm-hmm. And so when you really nail it and you get it right, people who find you, there's another part to like getting them to find you. Once they find you, though, they come to you and they say, "I want you," and this is why I want you. And those are the moments also that give me a decision point. If you really fit in, or I can say, all right, let's 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 explore this. Let's figure out what is it specifically that you are looking for? Where are your pain points? How, do, how am I thinking about helping you or serving you, right? And does this resonate for you? And is this something that I want to take on? Um, and so it's given me a great deal of empowerment. It also gives the client a great deal of empowerment. And I also find that when I tell them what the price is, they're like, okay. Or sometimes they're like, okay, I need to figure out how to make that work. You know, and, and so there's a lot less resistance across that. And some of that for me is 
for me, the, the pricing really fits with who you're serving and what they, you know, kind of where they are and how they value or how they look at something. And so understanding that connection also allowed me to, in fact, increase my rate for new clients. So I, in my contract, I have an annual increase. And since I started in January, the annual increase usually happens in July um, because I actually don't want to hike prices up January 1st because that's when everyone's signing up for therapy and I don't want to just, and a lot of people, there's other stuff going on. Like it's just after the holidays and people spend a lot of money and there's, there's all kinds of other stuff that are circumstantial happening there. And I don't want to just bump it up and I don't want to bump it up for all my existing clients around that time. So I chose the other half of the year, um, but I didn't bump it up at that time. And so I decided you know, three quarters of the way through the year when I'm onboarding people, I would start them at that higher price and, and everyone else will end up kind of catching up at some point. Um, or chances are really what I'll do is I'm not going to raise the price on the, on the patients I had that started earlier um, because they'll get, they'll get out. Um, they'll get what they need and they'll, they'll go. I, I like to also say my goal is not to keep people in therapy, it's to get them out of therapy. Um, <laughs> so the length of their stay has to do with the length of time, the minimum length of time that they need to get what they need out of therapy. So again, that's that's like, I am that much, I'm that deeply committed and interested in my patient's outcomes. Like I have negative interest in holding them any longer than they need to be um, mm -hmm. in therapy. Well, you said something that really struck a chord with me, which is, you know, you, as you've gotten more clear about who you work with, how you serve them, now when, when the ideal client comes through, we're going to speak in business terms, right? We wouldn't necessarily talk about this in terms of providing service to our patients, but there's a perceived value when you get the right people through the door, right? So if you have an area of expertise, which is you work with people in this, you know, high performing, high earning, they come in and they expect value from the get-go. When you have someone who has a different mindset coming through, the price just is a price. It's, you know, it's a cost to them. Or at that, you know, at that price point, it's a cost to them. And so I do think it's about attracting the right level and the right level of client, the right, you know, people who qualify to be your client or your patient. And I think it's really interesting. Of course, you're providing value. You're providing value to people who can't afford your rates as well. But the perception is at a particular level when you use the kind of language that your ideal client uses. So did you like jump inside their brains <laughs> into the language section of their brains and pull that out? <laughs> How did you? How I did listened. You yeah. So, you know, people talk about how therapists, like our job is to listen. It's not the only thing we do. Um, and there's a lot of other things that, that my brain is concurrently doing at the same time. One of the things that I realized is I got trained as a clinician to listen and think about what is going on internally for my patients and how to illuminate that process, also how to help improve that process. Um, you know, think about it as a clock and one of the gears isn't perfectly fitting anymore. So now it might slip a little bit or the clock starts to run a little bit slow. And so what my brain is doing as they're talking is my brain is like, you know, taking out the back of the clock and watching all of the pieces with a microscope. Um, everything from the language to the topics they're talking about to even some of the subtext. And there's a lot of stuff that I'm tracking. And so I got trained to do that. What I didn't get trained in is to listen and think about, okay, who has, when someone has an issue with this particular piece of the gear system, right? how do they talk about it? In other words, how does that look when the clock is ticking? And how does that look by way of pattern for this very specific group of people who have a very specific set of challenges? And so the shift that happened for me is I started actually paying attention to that in addition to tracking everything else. Or rather, I gave myself permission to think about it afterwards. I hope you enjoyed part one of my incredible interview with Dr. Yishai. I can't wait to share the second part of our interview with you next week, where Yishai breaks down how he sets aside six hours each week for high-level strategic thinking, planning, and business development. 
Yishai talks a lot about tinkering, or as I like to call it, testing and constant course correction. Oh, I love this. This is, this is so juicy. <laughs> You're not going to want to miss it. Also, I'd like to invite you to mark your calendar for Wednesday, November 9th at noon Eastern time. I'm offering a special masterclass on this very subject of setting aside time for working on your business, ways to do that, and how to avoid burnout. You'll not want to miss it. Details are coming next week, but for now, mark your calendar. Wednesday, November 9th, noon Eastern time. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Thriving Practice. I appreciate you coming here week after week, dear listener, to listen and learn how to elevate your leadership, grow your practice, and to think and act like the high impact CEO provider that you're meant to be. I have one request of you. If you've benefited from this show, go to Apple Podcasts and leave us a five-star review with your thoughts on the show. Your feedback and review help us get in front of other amazing practice owners just like you. Thank you again for listening and until next time.